Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. This is the redistricting track. We're going to get nerdy here today. We're going to talk. <laughs> we're going to talk about redistricting criteria with lots of fun metrics and measurements. So uh, again, I'm Justin Villery uh, with Draw the Lines in the Committee of Seventy. Um, what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, Michael Waxenberg and Ann Hanna. Um, we've all drawn uh, all three of the maps: um, uh, congressional, state house, state senate, Pennsylvania. Our organization, and Ann and Michael were part of this too, but they both um, worked with fair districts as well. So draw the lines, uh, focus mostly on the congressional mapping side. So I'm going to talk about the metrics for uh, the most recent map uh, um, for congressional. I'm going to turn it over to Michael, and he uh, worked very closely with a few other mappers on the state legislative maps. Uh, and then uh, we're going to, so the two of us are going to talk about metrics and how those uh, um, uh, metrics played into uh, the 22 maps and, uh, compared to some of the previous maps. Then we're going to turn it over to Ann, and Ann is going to look at how those maps played out in the 22 election. Then we're going to do a quick, uh, we've got a panel um, with some questions, but at any point if you all have questions throughout this process, then let us know. So that said, we have, everybody should have a packet of cards uh, at, your, uh, at your seat. And this is a game that we always played, and we played this with high schoolers and college students to introduce them to the mapping criteria or priorities that they have to balance when they are drawing a map. And so we're going to play that, uh, that game right now. It's called Flashes of Insight. And what you should do is everybody can, and yeah, we can just leave it on this. Um, uh, so undo your, your packet, and then everyone should have 10 cards. There's only nine up here, but there's a wild card in your packet as well. And so what we ask uh, students and participants to do is order the priorities that matter most to you, uh, top to bottom. So say, for example, you think equal, equal population. That is a, um, uh, a federally guaranteed um, uh, uh, criteria. So that's number one for me. This is just an example. Or you think, I believe that we need to have competitive districts, as many as we can. Uh, other consequences be damned. And so you put that number one. And then so what you're doing is you're, you're ranking one to five, one to six, one to three, one to ten, if you want to go all the way, um, what matters most to you. So while you all do that, I'm going to talk through, I think it's fairly clear because this has been mentioned multiple times, and Anthony, and the, if you were here for Anthony's session just a second ago, um, he went fairly in depth into this and how it played out in Michigan. But I'll give a quick background on each of these cards. Just going uh, top to bottom, left to right, minority representation. This is uh, the idea that communities of color uh, have the right to uh, uh, elect someone who represents their interests and values. Uh, it's uh, uh, protected under the Voting Rights Act, or at least it's protected as of today. It's under court uh, um, scrutiny, uh, or continually under court scrutiny. But you know um, that's reflected in um, uh, most commonly in majority minority districts, which means um, districts in which uh, a majority of uh, the residents in that district, uh, voting residents, are uh, um, a minority population. So that's minority representation. Competitive elections, and we're going to get into a distinction here between competitive elections and something else in this list. Competitive elections is just the sheer number of districts in which either party can win, right? So commonly thought of as about 10 percentage points either way. That's competitive elections. Party advantage right next to it. When we first designed this, um, this game uh, about five or six years ago, we didn't really think of or understand responsiveness, the idea of like partisan fairness or um, responsiveness as we talk about it um, as much as we do today. So we reflect that kind of in this uh, idea of party advantage where either you want your party to win or you want things to be fair. So that's different than competitive elections. Does everybody understand like, the, the difference between those two things? Right. Equal population, um, we're going to talk about this a little bit later too. Uh, you can have equal population down to the person, which is mandated on the congressional side. Uh, literally, every single district has to have the same number of people as of Census Day uh, on April 1st, 2020. Um, or you can have a little more float in the state legislative maps, uh, plus or minus 0.5%, right? Is that, or is it plus or minus 5%, five, five sorry, yeah, yeah, 5%. Um, contiguity. The idea that you can't have a district separated from itself. I can't have uh, District 1 in Erie and also have District 1 in the Lehigh Valley. There has to be some sort of connection between those. That is a federally required uh, mandate. Uh, county municipal splits. Um, uh, any, uh, if you value keeping your county together, keeping your municipality together, again, we split Pittsburgh. That was a huge no-no. And so we, um, we went against that value for uh, the state Supreme Court. 
Compactness, it was interesting, I thought in Anthony's presentation, compactness was not very high at all on the Michigan um, criteria. Uh, in the Pennsylvania state constitution for state legislative maps, compactness is mentioned, but there's no, it's, what's the exact wording? You have to have as compact the districts as possible or something like that. There's no like measurement that declares what is a compact district, so there's some float there. You all remember Goofy kicking Donald Duck? <laughs> that was not a compact district, but theoretically it was, constitutional. So, uh, communities of interest, we've talked about that a fair amount today, um, so I don't feel like I need to rehash what a community of interest is. Uh, and then incumbent protection, um, the idea, you could look at this as a, either as a positive or a negative. You know, my uh, legislator knows my district well, he or she has been uh, representing that district for multiple terms, they know those issues, uh, and so they should have a leg up. Alternatively, it's like, what these people who are incumbents, they just protect all the time, they get fat and lazy, and they, they're not doing anything for us. So, and then there's wild card. There's other, other, other notions in there as well, values that we don't pretend to know that uh, um, uh, you all might think are important. So, I've blabbered on long enough, hopefully for all of you to get your, your order set. Is there anyone who wants to volunteer what their top one, two, three criteria were? Yes, Brian. All right, so he's, he said equal population, right. compactness, right. contiguity, and then? Uh, county and municipal splits. And, and, county and municipal splits. And party advantage. And party advantage. Mm-hmm. I'm going to, instead of repeating everything you're saying. I'll, make it, I'll try to make it brief. Equal population is super important because if you're R or D, you can game the system by giving yourself small population districts and giving a lot of them, right? And give the other side large population districts. And then compactness we found is really important because if you, if you really make districts compact, you're going to probably get um, diversity of, of party, urban, rural, and also um, diversity of ethnicities to an extent, at least as a first draft. And then continuity is just required as part of compactness. And then minimize county and municipal splits prevents goofy kicking Donald Duck because, you know, it, the finer art of gerrymandering. And then it's really no party, party advantage should be called partisan fairness, right? right? Mm -hmm. And to make sure that the eventual, the seat share, the anticipated seat share matches the vote share. So those are your dominant ones. I don't want to take, take over your thing so you could talk, have someone else talk about the other. No, that's great. Is there anybody else who had uh, either the same or a different uh, set of criteria? Maybe top two, top three? Yes, let me bring this to you. Hi, uh, my top five are competitive elections, equal population, compactness, contiguity, and minority representation. Wonderful. Can I ask you why you had those? Yeah, I, I mean, I look at the map and I kind of complained about the, the current map, even though I'll, mostly it, it got to where I wanted to go. Because if you look at it right now, the state legislative map, only 10% of the seats about are competitive. And to me, you know, if, first of all, I ran for state rep in 2020 and I was one, and I was in one of the competitive districts. Millions of dollars go into these very few districts and the chance for all the other districts to flip is minuscule. So the responsiveness in my mind to, you know, to the people is diminished if we don't have competitive districts. And I'm actually like, this is, I, that's one of the reasons I came to this session. I'd love to hear what you guys' opinion is on that because I think that, you know, I, I, that was one of the Princeton gerrymandering criticisms of the map and I'd love to hear what you have to, to say about that. Also, I think minority representation, I think, is required by federal law. So that was one of, why it was one of my top five. But you really have to look at, you know, m much of what the gentleman before me said about equal population, which was part of like Baker versus Carr and, and the original, you know, Supreme Court decisions on this. And, you know, contiguity and compactness, I think, are, are going to get you to where you need to go. So. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing. Anybody else who's burning to share? 
All right, cool. So uh, we teach this to our high schoolers when they do this, and we ask them to draw two lessons out of this. The first is that there's no one right way to do this. Redistricting is very much, it's a science, as we're going to talk about, but it's also an art, right? And so you have to balance all these different priorities. And that's the second lesson, is there's no one right way to draw the map, and you have to create this, uh, this deep balance and compromise around this. So with that said, we pulled out, this is the, um, the congressional map. I'm going to look at the congressional map for the next few minutes. This is the Carter plan. This is the plan that was produced by 12, 13 plaintiffs, um, so-called Carter um, plaintiffs, uh, that submitted a map to the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court, one of 13 um, maps that the court considered. I apologize for the, um, the, my lack of projector quality here. It's kind of hard to see these. But uh, um, uh, this was the map that the State Supreme Court chose because, in their words, it created a, uh, enough balance between the different criteria that they were trying to uh, negotiate. And they relied a lot on uh, the wording in the Pennsylvania State Constitution for legislative maps, which in the state constitution there are four criteria, I think, check me if I'm correcting this, um, that are uh, required of state legislative maps, and they apply to the congressional as well. Equal population and contiguity, those are kind of the two given. Then uh, districts that minimize county and municipal splits, and then districts that are reasonably compact. Those are the values that are mentioned in the state constitution. But then the court also adopted several other in, in, uh, interesting principles. They uh, adhered to something called the least change principle in the Carter map, which said that districts that were put in place by the landmark uh, League of Women Voters case in 2018 that struck down Goofy kicking Donald Duck in the 2011 gerrymander, they wanted to create a map that changed the least amount uh, um, from that 2018 map that was put in place. And so this map, I think, had the, it was like 80% of residents in Pennsylvania have the same um, uh, represent or, or in the same district as they were previously, which is fairly impressive considering we lost a congressional seat just like Michigan did. So that was a, a, a clarifying value of the Carter map. They also put a um, fairly premium emphasis on partisan fairness, making sure that uh, the, the maps, not necessarily competitiveness, but that the maps reflected some level, I think everybody's very careful not to say the word proportionality, because that uh, can get you in some trouble, but that there is some sense that the number of votes for a particular party roughly equate to the number of seats that, that party wins. So I'm going to split uh, all those different values that uh, we just talked about into four different slides to compare what the 2011 uh, congressional plan, this is the one that was an enduring 13 to 5 Republican advantage from 2012, 2014, 2016, regardless of the types of votes. So that's the top number. 2018 plan was the plan that came about from the League of Women Voters case. And then I have to put up our citizens map because I'm very proud of that map. Michael and Ann had a lot of work on that map too. Um, and then of course the Carter map that was chosen by the State Supreme Court. You will see, not so much in this slide, but in the previous three, that top plan was abysmal in every one of these criteria. <laughs> the Supreme Court plan was really, really good. It was a, a strong plan from the metrics. The citizens map, I think we did a, a fairly good job. And the Carter map <coughs> was uh, um, a very effective map as well. Yes, Anthony, you had a thought? One person. So congressional. Th and this is, and I'm, in our conversation, we're going to talk about this. In a congressional plan, not a state legislative, congressional map, you have to have the exact same number of people down to the person uh, uh, per district, which if you think about it, is absurd, right? Because you've got, the census is not a, like a completely scientific uh, um, count of everyone. It's a sampling. For, well, it's, it's not a sampling, but, you know, there are changes from the moment census day is done on April 1st, 2020. People have died, people were born since that day, people moving in and out of the district just from that day. And so it's, it's absurd to think that there are exactly the same number of people in a district at any given time. Yes? Why does the phrase proportional representation the government? Because there are, it's a loaded term, and you all can jump in at any point and help me out with this. It's a loaded term because it's, <laughs> it's not in the Constitution. And as soon as you say, well, we should have proportional representation, then people start saying, well, that's what they have in England, in Europe. Do you want us to be? Uh, a parliamentary uh, system too. It's like, oh, we've gone down the way wrong track here. So I've had that beaten out of me. Um, so. I'll just also add that in addition to that, you know, in some states that are that are not like Pennsylvania, that are not pretty close to 50-50, it is actually very hard to obtain proportional representation 
with geographic districts. For example, if you try to draw a Republican-leaning congressional district in Massachusetts, given the way that Republicans and Democrats are distributed, given the fact that it's a very, very strongly Democratic state, it's, it's just basically impossible to do so. I, th I think at least at some past point, uh, the MGGG group demonstrated you just can't. So in some cases, you really can't achieve proportional representation. The best you can do is try to achieve some level of responsiveness so that if the minority party achieves a certain threshold, they can start winning districts. And when you get to the 50-50 level, then you can start to you know, be pretty symmetric and pretty close to what the parties actually achieve in statewide vote share. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. All right, let's move on. These are fairly self-explanatory. You don't see too much of this, too much difference. Uh, the splits is really interesting. So again, we point this out because this was a constitutional value for the legislative maps that were put forth as a value to pursue in the congressional maps as well. So the 2011 plan split 100, had 173 different splits. So if I split Dauphin County you know, between one district, that counts as one split. If I split it between three districts, then that's two splits, right? And so moving forward, you add up the counties, the municipalities, and the divisions or wards into a split. And so the 2011 plan was terrible on this front. 2018, the Supreme Court plan, that improved. Citizens map, that was a prior uh, a goal of ours because um, it was reflected as a goal among our, uh, our mappers. And then the Carter map, um, uh, you can see there. So again, I, I point this out just because it was such a, an extreme difference between that and 2011. Compactness, so you're gonna see these two statistical measurements. Essentially, what you need to know about this is the more, uh, the higher the number, the more compact it is as a relative to like a perfect circle, like a, a perfect circle of a district is 100%. You're never gonna have a perfect circle. A really good compactness score on average is gonna be for a district or a statewide plan, is gonna be in the 40s, maybe the, the low 50s, actually really, you rarely get into the, uh, to the low 50s, particularly on the Polsby Popper, kind of similar on REAC. So again, the congressional plan, this is Goofy Kicking Donald, uh, really, really poor from 2011, uh, and it's steadily improved uh, um, throughout, this, throughout this process. And then lastly, this is the fun one, the partisan fairness metrics. And these can go all over the place. You're, so we look first off at competitive districts. Um, the uh, 2011 congressional plan, that is one district on average per election, 2012, 2014, 2016. 2018 plan produced on average four districts in the two uh, election cycles in which it was used. And then the citizens map and the Carter map using composite election data would have uh, generally produced about five uh, competitive seats per. You're never, you're gonna have a really hard time getting more than that in Pennsylvania without sacrificing on other values, without sacrificing on county municipal splits and compactness. We had one of our competition um, members drew, I think Kyle drew what, 16 compact or competitive districts. He went 16 out of uh, 17. And it looked like a tiger had literally claw clawed through the state because he was trying to connect Philadelphia with, you know, Northeastern, North Central, and Western PA. So um, it's, uh, that's, that's one of those, those things, the lessons that we were talking about is that you're gonna have um, uh, trade-offs that you have to make here. The efficiency gap, Anthony talked a little about this. This is, uh, in partisan bias, these are two metrices that we don't need to get into the, the deep details, Michael and Ann can if they want, but um, you want these numbers to be close to zero as possible, right? And so if you've got an efficiency gap uh, that's plus 19% uh, uh, in favor of Republicans. That means that they are, uh, the term is wasted votes. You're, as a Democrat, you're wasting um, a lot more uh, of your votes in either uh, races that you don't win or races that you're winning by a lot. In Philadelphia, you know, you wanna, if you're a gerrymanderer, you wanna win your races 55, 45, 60, 40, and you want your opponent to win as few races as they can, but like 90 to 10, because they're wasting their votes. And so the efficiency, gap and partisan bias start to, to start to measure that. So that's all I've got on this, the criteria of how the old maps compare to the new maps um, uh, uh, on the congressional side. I'm gonna turn it over to Michael here to, uh, to talk about the legislative side. Thank you, Justin. I'm gonna go a little light on metrics actually and I'm gonna tell more of a story. It, to some extent, it's a, a well-known story to some of you, the, the evolution of our view of, of redistricting fairness. 
Um, but I'm going to try to give you a, a mapper's perspective on it. I, I was the lead mapper for the Senate map with fair districts. So um, I'll look at it in, in three steps. First, how we got, got here and how I look at that as a mapper, that evolution. Uh, then move on to two questions about the new maps. Are they better than the old maps? That's the easy question. And then the harder one, are they fair? And we'll consider that from a few different perspectives. So let's move on, Justin. Um, How did we get here? There, in the early stages of, of this uh, reform effort, there was a very idealistic approach, really. The idea, in, in general terms, that um, 10 or 15, maybe 11, Pennsylvanians of good faith could get into a room together um, and perhaps behind, behind a, a veil of ignorance, not even knowing uh, partisan data, not or uh, historical election data, partisan registration data, that they could draw fair or at least fairer maps just based on following some rules. Um, how that would have turned out, we don't know, because as as you know, that reform effort was smothered um, in the Capitol. Um, but we can maybe revisit that a little later, circling back and drawing on what uh, Anthony's told us about Michigan to think how it might have played out. Let's go on, though, to the next stage of the process, which was LACRA. LACRA was a scaled back, less, am less ambitious attempt at reform um, built on the existing structure, the existing LRC structure for the legislature, the existing legislative process for the congressional map. Um, it did impose some new requirements, some, some very stringent requirements for transparency, which is a, a real priority for FDPA. And it did establish some basic mapping rules that would be imposed on the existing process, notably the N plus one rule for Senate and congressional districts, the so-called N plus two for state house. That has to do with how many times you can divide a county um, above the, the number of divisions that are absolutely necessary to create districts. LACRA two was gutted in committee, so we don't exactly know how that would have turned out either. Um, but let, let's move on because I, I think it's important to emphasize, you can go to the next slide, Justin. Um, it's, it's important from my perspe perspective for you to know how important these efforts and the way that they sustained reform momentum were to sustaining our interest, building interest among mappers and building our skill set. Um, it all really starts, I think, with, with Amanda Holt. Uh, I call her the Joan of Arc of Pennsylvania mappers. You may not agree with everything that she believed. That's true of a lot of people with Joan of Arc as well. But uh, we all admire her determination and her courage um, and a lot of the things that she did achieve. Um, but while that process w was going on, while, while Amanda was tilting at some windmills and also achieving some things, um, the tools were being rolled out to the masses, giving us tremendous mapping power. And in parallel with that, there were academic efforts going on across the country. Moon Duchen was mentioned earlier, but it was at universities across the country, uh, from there, Princeton, Berkeley, everywhere in America, we were getting great scholarly work, which then fed back into the tools with improved metrics that we could use to assess the maps that were being drawn. Um, and all of this sort of took off in 2018. There was this thunderbolt from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court when they struck down, as Justin mentioned, the, the congressional map. Um, there was an explosion of popular interest, an explosion of energy, and educational efforts were critical to that, uh, driven primarily by Draw the Lines and FDPA themselves. Um, the LACRA, although ultimately unsuccessful, um, helped us as mappers by setting some concrete parameters, by uh, setting some, uh, some guideposts that we could measure our maps against, and also kicking off a debate about what was really important. You've just contributed to that debate by ordering those cards. Um, and over the course of five years, there was this growing community debating those values continuously. Let's go to the next slide. The mapping contests were critical to that, to sustaining interest, including during periods when there were setbacks in the reform effort. Because there was always the, this current of contributions, the, this current of energy running, particularly through high schools and college campuses, with people drawing maps. There were differences between DTL's approach and FDPA's approach. Draw the Lines asked us to set our own criteria and they would evaluate our maps based on the, on the values that we set, the precedents that we set. FDPA said, LACRA is the rule set. We're going to assess your maps based on the LACRA rules. But both of those were valuable, and both of those created a kind of tension, a kind of balance, where we could debate what was really important and debate the value of those LACRA criteria themselves. Um, that led to the creation, as Justin mentioned, of the citizens map for Congress and also the people's maps for the legislature, for both the House and the Senate. 
And all of this activity just continually enriched the ongoing debate about values, not just among mappers, but among legislators, le legislators, lobbyists, and all the other stakeholders in the process. So what have we learned through all this about this controversial topic of fairness? Well, first of all, neat and compact districts are not always good. As Justin mentioned, a perfectly compact district is a circle. It's not even that simple because you could have variations in population distribution within the circle. But more importantly, any set of rules can be abused. And it is possible, I could draw you a 17 district map with 17 circles, wouldn't really fit very well in Pennsylvania, but in a hypothetical state I could, and it could still be a terrible gerrymander. It could still be an overtly partisan map by other metrics. Conversely, the other side of that coin, odd shapes are not always bad. To some extent, we've been victims of our own marketing here and our own education campaign. We've created a mindset in the public that anything that looks weird is bad. And certainly in the case of Goofy kicking Donald Duck, that's true. But in a lot of cases, you need to draw a funny looking district in order to accommodate a community of interest, in order to draw around a natural boundary, for example, that creates a real boundary between political communities of interest. Um, and lastly, always keep in mind that every metric that we show you has built into it certain assumptions and judgments. Probably the most glaring example is competitive districts. What historic data are you using to measure whether that district really is competitive? And how close to 50-50 does a district have to be for you to regard it as competitive? 5% either way, 3% either way? And what other uh, factors are you going to build in? If there's an incumbent defending that district, do you consider that as well in diminishing the competitiveness? Let's move on. Um, so that brings us finally to the Legislative Reapportionment Commission. But I want to stress, we were ready to hit the ground running because of the efforts of all of, all of you and the advocacy groups in front of you today. Um, we were ready long before the LRC was. All we needed was census data. Now, once the LRC put itself together, there were four members initially, and it took them a while to get a chairman because they, they couldn't agree on one. The Supreme Court had to impose Mr. Nordenberg, Chancellor Nordenberg. Uh, but it was very clear from the very beginning that there were stark differences between what was going to happen on the Senate side and what was going to happen on the House side. The Senate leaders were collaborating from day one. They happened to be friends, and they were working together in a very collegial way that ultimately culminated in a 5-0 vote on the LRC, which looks great. But the goals that they were pursuing together are ones about which we have certain reservations, which I'm sure we'll be talking about more later. The House leaders, on the other hand, do not like each other at all, had trouble being in the same room together. It was visible in every word they said to each other and even in their body language when they had to deal with each other. Chair Nordenberg himself, uh, when he arrived, brought in his own vision of fairness and his own idea of what good maps are. And impressively, his views evolved over time based on input from the other commission members and based on input from the terrific senior staff that he had, uh, notably the mapping consultant John Service and his superb uh, chief counsel, um, Bob Beyer, Robert Beyer. Um, they come from very different backgrounds, but both had tremendous input into the process. And as a result, those draft ma maps that we saw several months later reflected starkly different priorities. Now, on the, on the positive side, the process was historically transparent. There was a lot of backroom dealing, but at least there were an extensive series of public hearings and tremendous access to data and the ability to post comments publicly. So that was a plus. Unfortunately, I have to say most of our input was at least after the draft maps were published, between then and the final maps, most of our input was rather ineffective. Most of the late work um, by the commission was focused on incorporating or um, uh, responding to other concerns than the ones that had been raised by the citizens on their website. Let's move on. I'll try to wrap up quickly with the two big picture questions. Are the maps better? And in a word, yes. They are unquestionably better by the vast majority of metrics that, that we use. They're more compact, there are fewer splits, they're much more responsive, at least at the aggregate level, to voter sentiment. And we will return to the concentration of influence in a few districts. And there was a demonstrable effort, certainly on the House map, to a lesser extent on the Senate map, to serve communities of interest. And that manifested itself in, in multiple ways that we can talk about as we go on. Now, the harder question is, are they fair? 
by most measures, and I can, look, we can all make metrics say whatever we want, but by most of the measures we use and using most of the data that we think is reliable, yes, the house map is quite fair. It reflects almost perfectly, and Anne will go into this, the close partisan division of a very purple state offers both parties a credible opportunity for control. So at the, at the top line level, it is highly responsive. Generally it adheres to the traditional rules and standards. Most of the deviations from those rules are at least defensible, and communities of interest are preserved where feasible, and I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking about that more as well. Now on the, on the downside, notable shortcomings of the house map, relatively few competitive districts, that's unfortunate. There are some unnecessary splits that are rather difficult to defend, most notably around cities, up in my area, around Scranton. Scranton is split multiple ways in ways that really aren't very easy to explain or defend. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned before, adjustments to the draft map appear to reflect the tensions within the LRC much more than citizen feedback. And specifically, the LRC had to focus on indemnifying the house map against endless litigation. And if you look at most of the changes that occurred between the draft and the final house map, you'll see that they were trying to respond to some of those complaints. Um, wrapping up with the Senate map, by most measures, by contrast, the Senate map, frankly, is disappointing. Incumbent protection was evidently paramount. That was the main goal that they pursued together. Uh, change of control is possible, as Carol mentioned, but it does appear unlikely, at least in the near term, unless we see a dramatic shift in voter sentiment. Uh, competitive districts are limited, you know, there are some, but there were missed opportunities to create more in a number of places, including South Central. Um, Luzerne and Burks are just butchered, and I, I can't make head or tails of why that happened other than to defend a few uh, incumbents. Minority representation clearly was not a priority, most dramatically in Philadelphia and uh, in the Lehigh Valley. There were opportunities to give Hispanic voters in Pennsylvania a chance to elect the, the first um, uh, Senator, state senator of Hispanic descent, uh, they didn't even pursue it. Um, in aggregate, southeastern Pennsylvania is underrepresented. It's a real problem. It's not so much district by district population variation, but in aggregate, districts in southeastern Pennsylvania are overpopulated. Districts in southwestern uh, Pennsylvania are underpopulated. That means that southwestern Pennsylvania is rather significantly overpopulated, or overrepresented, I'm sorry, in the Senate map. It is probably not a coincidence that both of the caucus leaders represent districts in, you can probably guess it, southwestern Pennsylvania, right. Um, and lastly, of particular interest to this group, population centers in south central pa uh, Pennsylvania do remain cracked as they were before. It's unfortunate. Um, I, I'm lastly going to share one personal grievance about the Senate map, it being the holiday season. We're coming up on Festivus, for those of you who watch Seinfeld. Uh, it is the, the season of airing grievances, so here's mine. Um, I set out, when I, when I took on the Senate map with FTP, I, I set out a mission for myself. I said, I am going to fix our district, which for 50 years has been this hideous collar wrapped around Scranton to preserve the influence of uh, the one particular party in Wilkesboro. Um, Unfortunately, I failed. This is not the old district. This is the new 20th district, sadly enough. And as you can see, in order to drop off literature at Senator Baker's house, Marn and I are going to have to drive across two other districts. But with that grievance in mind, the whole white district is one district. yeah, the 20th wraps all the way around the 22nd and the 40th. But I'm not going to dwell on my personal misgivings. The, the fact is, there is much to celebrate in both of these maps, especially the House map. There's much for all of you to celebrate about what you've accomplished, and frankly, much to congratulate about what the LRC did. They really did a fine job. And uh, thank you for that. To talk about how this all played out on Election Day, I'm going to hand it off to Ann. Hello, everybody. So um, Michael and Justin have given me the privilege of going into some of the lovely, fun, nitty-gritty of these actual results. Um, we end at 2.10, right? So I'm going to try to go through this as fast as I can and not go through all the gory details to give us time for discussion. Um, uh, to start, slide. So I just want to caveat this with the only thing we really know about the election results is who was elected. You know, we, we don't know what they're going to do in office. We don't know how they're going to be on the issues. We don't really know yet whether a lot of the community of interest concerns that people expressed are going to be, you know, very well 
handled in this map because we, we just we haven't seen them in action yet. We haven't we don't even know who's going to be the Speaker of the House on January 3rd, despite the fact that you know theoretically one Democrats won a one seat majority in the House. There's all these complications that were discussed in the beginning of the event. Um, and so you know I'm going to talk a lot about party membership, like which party won which seats. You know what are the the which which seats have minority voters? How many women are there? All these kind of things. But you know that's not destiny. We don't really know what these people are going to do until we give them a chance to do it. Even though many of them are incumbents, and we do actually know what those people are going to do. Um, so we'll we'll do what we can with what we've got, and we'll update as we go forward. Slide, please. All right. So first thing to understand about this: there there were two different sets of elections that were affected by these new maps. There was the, our primaries on May 16th, and there was the general election uh, just this November. And the primary elections were fairly severely affected, not just by the maps, but by the timeline on which the maps became available. Because as um, you probably all remember, the census data collection finalization was delayed by COVID and by some <clears throat> Trump administration sabotage. Um, so you know, that didn't end until October 15th of 2020. In 2016, we, we didn't get the, the actual data in the states until September uh, 16th of 2021. And then we had, you know, by necessity in the LRC, there was a lengthy process of, you know, draft maps, hearings and draft maps, and more hearings and final maps and so forth. On the uh, congressional side, or sorry, on the congressional map side, the legislature and the governor were working to pass those. And of course, the legislature had its own, had some hearings, also had some, a lot of behind the scenes negotiations. They came out with maps very late. They tried to push the governor to take them. The governor did not want to take them. There was fortunately already some uh, impasse le legislate or litigation, excuse me, in process, and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ended up designing those maps. And so, the um, the end result was we didn't even have the final version of the draft maps from the LRC for the state legislative seats until February fourth of this year, and those maps didn't get finalized in terms of the, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court dismissing all the challenges to them until March sixteenth. And then the, uh, the congressional uh, plan wasn't finalized as selecting the Carter plan until February 23rd. So both of those things happened pretty late. And then the result of that was that, as, as many of you probably know, were involved in various campaigns, the ballot signature collection period for the state legislative districts was dramatically compressed. And it started like two days after the, uh, the state Supreme Court uh, dismissed all the challenges to those maps. So people literally didn't know until two days before they were st going to be starting to collect ballot signatures whether those districts were going to be the final districts or not. And this was particularly a big challenge because one of the goals that uh, Chair Nordenberg had explicitly stated and, and also um, Minority Leader McClinton on the House side had stated is they wanted to really improve minority representation, particularly in the House. And so they went out of their way to do a lot of work, you know, as much as they could with the data they had to create minority opportunity and majority minority districts in many parts of the state that had not had them. In particular, you know, there was a big push for, because the uh, Latino Hispanic population of Pennsylvania has been increasing over the past decade, there was a push to try to create districts for those communities. Um, and especially, not, not just uh, opportunity districts, but open seat districts so that um, you know, candidates would have a chance to run without having to challenge an incumbent. And so this did, the fact that there was such a shortened timeline for candidates to get on the ballot caused challenges, and I'll talk about them with respect to the specific maps, made it difficult for a lot of candidates to even get on the ballot, much less you know, fundraise for primaries and mount credible primary challenges. So this, this shortened timeline really did pose some challenges for um, achieving like the minority representation goals that uh, people had been hoping for with this map. And, and you know, on the one hand, there is probably a lot of room over the next rest of the cycle, both as those minority populations continue to grow and take more power in those districts for you know, maybe more candidates to come forward. But on the other hand, you now have the candidates who won these elections being established as incumbents, and it may be harder to overturn them in the future. So, this is probably going to be a slower process of getting more minority representation in Pennsylvania than many people had hoped for. So that's kind of just one big impact of the timeline. Um, slide, please. So let me just go through the maps one by one here and kind of talk about the, the basic outcomes. Um, as you may recall, you know, we're 50-50-ish state. Our previous congressional delegation uh, elected from the, uh, the 2018 litigation map. Let's see if I can distract this. There we go. 
uh, was uh, nine Democrats, nine Republicans. And because we went from 18 to 17 districts, we, we lost one of those. And the end result of this map was now we have nine Democrats and eight Republicans. So that's about 53%, you know, to about 47% uh, in the congressional delegation, which pretty closely matches the top of the ballot races. You know, Fetterman Oz, Fetterman's a little lower than that. Shapiro's a little higher than that. And so, you know, this is a pretty good match. Now, um, this map that I've got shown here on the picture, which I, you can't, it's a little bit uh, uh, color screwed, but the, um, this map is the map of the predictions from DRA from their standard election prediction composite data set from the past like 2016 to 2020 elect, top ballot elections. And this map sort of baldly predicts it's a 10-7 map if, if you look just at, at that, that data set. Different data sets make slightly different predictions, but that's what that data set predicts. But the reality is that these election results of 9-8 were exactly in line with what everybody expected when the map came out because the Bucks County District, which for those of you who don't know where Bucks County is, right over here, uh, has had a, a fairly long relationship with its current representative and has not changed much over the past couple redistrictings. It's pretty much always been Bucks County plus a little bit. And uh, a Republican, uh, why did I forget the man's name? Pat Fitz, Brian Fitzpatrick, yes. Just lost his first name. Brian Fitzpatrick um, won that seat pretty handily despite it having a slight Democratic lean, not only in this map, but also in the 2018 map, and also even if the 2011 map was still in operation today, it would pretty much have a Democratic lean as well. So he, he held on even though people were saying, oh, well, this is a 10-7 map. It's not, it's, it's, it's a 9-8 map because of him. Now, if incumbency changes, if, if other things change, that may change. But given, given the way that the, this map was done, designed and who's in office, and, and again, who's in office really influenced the design of all these maps. You know, everything changes if who's in office it would, would be different or if that wasn't taken into account. Um, one kind of exciting thing for me in this new map is we, we did elect uh, another uh, female representative this year, uh, Summer Lee over in the Pittsburgh district, that dark blue one. Uh, I don't know what it looks like, but uh, so she, she, she won that district. Um, so now we're slightly closer to having a 50-50 delegation as we should. Um, we also elected, again, Summer Lee, another minority representative. So finally, we have something like proportionality in minority representation in Pennsylvania. But one interesting thing, which I think uh, Anthony talked about earlier, is you don't necessarily always elect majority minority, or minority representatives from majority minority districts and vice versa. So if you look in Pennsylvania, there are, there are Pennsylvania's two big districts and then one piece, Pennsylvania. Two, two districts that are all in Pennsylvania, and then one gives a piece to the, the uh, was that fifth now? District over there. So um, those two, two districts in Pennsylvania that are fully in Philadelphia, excuse me, the two districts that are fully in Philadelphia are both majority minority te technically. Uh, one, the, uh, the one further to the west, is strongly majority minority, elects Dwight Evans and has for a while, and he is black, but the district that I live in, which is the other one, is still majority minority, but uh, it selected Brendan Boyle recently, and he is white. So, but he is and has been the majority of of, of black voters and, and Latino voters in the general election do vote for him. So, in some sense, he is the candidate of choice of the the voters of color. But he also didn't even have a primary challenge this year, which is how how solidly he is in there for now. But then, Summer Lee's district actually is not majority minority. It does have a significant minority population. But it's still like, I think, 70% white, give or take. And yet it elected a black representative this year. And I, she is clearly the cho voter candidate of choice, both of the voters of color in her district and many of the white voters. So minority representation can be compli complicated. But I think we've at least you know, had some advances here in Pennsylvania for this, this year. Um, another uh, another uh, thing that's changed here, we have Two new representatives. We also lost one former representative. Uh, Fred Keller was was kind of lived here-ish and chose not to uh, challenge either of the two districts, Glenn Thompson or, or uh, uh, Joyce. I think is the other guy. M oh, yeah, you're right. It's Muser. I'm sorry. Joyce is a different or different thing um, for for the seat. He, he didn't ch challenge either Republicans, and he just went out. And we have two new Democrats, both replacing retired Democrats. So, you know, we didn't have a huge amount of change in the delegation from that. 
Um, one talking point, by the way, that some people use to say both that the congressional map and the House, the state house map are gerrymandered, is it is true that if you look at the total number of votes that Republicans received for congressional races and for state house races and the total number of votes Democrats received for those, in both cases Republicans received more total votes. But the reason for this, the top, top line reason for this at least, is uncontested districts. Uh, in this map, the congressional map, two Republicans, which I believe was uh, these two folks here, had no Democratic opponent. And there was only one uh, Democratic-leaning district, Dwight Evans's district here, that had no Republican opponent. He did have a Socialist Workers Party opponent who got about 5% of the vote. And so that imbalance means that, you know, there, there's literally zero Democratic congressional votes from two districts and then essentially zero Republican congressional votes from only one district. So that imbalance tends to skew the vote totals statewide. And you really need to take that into account when you're hearing those kind of statistics. Excuse them by more than the difference in the vote totals received by the two parties. So it, it's, this is why we tend to use the top of the line races to determine statewide partisan lean rather than those congressional and, and, and state house vote, vote totals. So screw that talking point. Um, the other, other point I'd make is that with relationship to competitiveness and responsiveness, um, you've got four districts that if you just look at sort of the basic stats on Dave's redistricting, there's four districts that are labeled as competitive, which is basically, you know, this, I think it's this Harrisburg one, and then these three here that are kind of in white. Um, and none of those districts changed their partisan lean in this election. And you know, none, of the, none of those districts was flipped. And it is, there, there's a lot of reasons that competitive districts don't work the way you would think they would. One is incumbent advantage. You know, each of those districts had a well-entrenched incumbent and did not have a strong challenger. Um, each of, and then you also have issues you know, with candidate quality, candidate funding, and then there's simply the issue. Let's imagine that I have a district that is 55% hard right Republicans and 45% hard left Democrats. You will never flip that district from Republican to Democrat in a million years unless something changes about the underlying voter preferences or un underlying voter distribution. But if you've got a district that's, you know, say, 35 Democrat, 45 Republican, and then 20% of people who can kind of go either way. Does that add up? I think that adds up. Uh, that, then, you know, that's a district that you can flip. And so the, these top of the line numbers don't mean that much. What you want to think about is not, you know, necessarily a count of supposedly crudely measured competitive districts, which again, you know, that can vary with the underlying data set and with your thresholds that you set for calling something competitive. You want to think about, does the whole map respond to how people vote? You know, if you, if you say, you know, the electorate as a whole becomes a little bit more Republican on average, is this map going to shift Republican? And I, I can tell you, hell yes. If the, the electorate becomes more Republican, these two districts are going to go Republican, and they will never come back to the Democrats. If the electorate becomes a little bit more Democratic as a whole, you might see, you know, this, this Bucks County district, you might see this Harrisburg region district going Democratic. And that, that's what you really want. You want to have some kind of... You want it to be kind of centered around a tipping point, and you want to see that things will actually shift when you, you know, cross that tipping point in either direction. That's what you're really trying to achieve, is responsiveness, not competitiveness. And, and there really are some areas of the state, like these districts will, should never, in my lifetime, elect a Democrat. They just shouldn't. You know, the people there don't want Democrats, and that's their choice. And the competition there is going to be in the Republican primary. My district over here, is never going to elect a Republican in my lifetime. And again, that's what voters in my area want. We want the competition to be in the Democratic primary. We want to choose the best Democrat to represent us, and that's, that's our choice. But what you want to do is be able to, and, and you want to have a variety of viewpoints represented in the legislature too. You want to have people who have all different kinds of views coming together to make the people's decisions. But you do want to make sure that the map responds and there are places where competition can happen and that can really make big changes. And of course, that's what we saw in the state house map. Can we uh, slide here? I'm going to try to speed through the rest of these two here. So um, the state senate map, the, the big uh, story of the state senate map is stasis, because really the map was not changed a heck of a lot from uh, 2020. You know, there, there was some tweaks around the edges. The one big thing that did change is the one um, independent representative who had formerly won his seat as a Democrat 
and then switched to caucus with the Republicans and being independent. He uh, sort of got moved out of his district and redistricting, did not run for election, and that seat was taken again by a Democrat. But literally, if you look at the district numbers, the last time these districts were up in 2018, you have the same number of Democratic and Republican ones, 12 Ds, 13 Rs, as in, um, as in 2018. So this, this is really, this, this map did not change much. You did get some churn, uh, you know, you got a couple new women. Unfortunately, there was a, a, a district in, District 14, I think, in the Lehigh Valley. There was some hope maybe a, a, a Latino member could be re, uh, elected there, but there was a Latino candidate on both sides of the primary election, neither of them won their primary. So that didn't happen this time around, you know, maybe in the future as that population grows more. Uh, there are six new senators, but pretty much all of them replaced incumbents of their same party. So, um, you know, either, I think there was a primary loss and there were some retirements. So, you know, and then there was only uh, four uncontested seats, same on, on both sides. And if there is change in the state Senate map or Senate composition, that's more likely to come in the 2024 elections rather than 2022. Uh, so let's go on to last one here, which is the state house. Now the state house, holy shit, right? <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, th this, this was a huge change. You know, there, there was a lot of really big shifts in the map design all across the board. Um, there was you know, a net change of, uh, I guess, 12 seats moving from Republican to Democratic. Although, you know, 20 district numbers kind of ended up with different representation, partly due to just where the, where the district numbers got shifted to in rearrangement. Um, there are 48 new people, if I think I've counted correctly, in the legislature who were not there before this election. Um, God, God, I think, and th th these numbers are a little bit shaky because I'm still working on with the data because it's, it's, you know, it's still brand new. We don't have a lot of the de details yet. But we, I think we've gained you know, a few female representatives and a few minority representatives because of those that work on opportunity districts and, and, uh, and, and you know, empowerment districts. Um, you know, and we're at the point where literally we don't know who's going to be Speaker of the House on January 3rd because we've got three Democrats who are, are potent, you know, one's dead, unfortunately. One uh, is moving to Congress, one is moving to, to the uh, Lieutenant Governorship. And you know, then there's also a Republican who is leaving her seat a little bit later, probably if she if she wins a, a state senate election that for a state senate seat that just opened for a special election. So there's going to be a lot of churn and a lot of craziness. There's opportunities for bipartisan cooperation. There's also opportunities for very partisan obstruction. <laughs> it's going to be very exciting to watch. And and this is a the fact that it's this close is a triumph of this map because we're a 50-50 purple state, and and that's where we should be is trying to hash these things out at a very you know, close margin. Um, the number of competitive districts is relatively low, only you know, 27 out of the 203 are, are considered to be competitive by that map. But again, you know, we're at this knife edge. We had two state house seats that were literally decided in provisional ballots by like 50 votes each. And, and one went one way and the other went the other way. This is how close this map is and this is what you know, everybody's work has added up to. And so I, I think we did a pretty good job here and we've got a lot of room to do more and hopefully make sure that next time we're not having to fight the politicians for control of the process. So thank you everybody and I think it's probably time for questions and whatever we can do, right? Sure. All right, yes. The question is, is how much of the uh, realignment is due to redistricting versus just general candidate quality or campaigning or anything else? Thank you. I, I did forget to mention that. So in, in pretty much all of these cases, the election outcomes are pretty close to what you could predict from the DRA, you know, databases and maps before the election. Particularly the House, you know, there were so many close seats that you couldn't really say, well, oh, it's going to be 100 and 201 or anything like that. You, but you could say, you know, there's going to be, I think there were, there were you know, what, 75-ish uncontested races, but you could say, you know, there's going to be a, the, the control of the chamber is going to be in the balance and you have no idea what is going to happen, was the DRA prediction for the House. Um, there were certainly some, I think on the minority representation side, you could certainly say there were, were candidate resource challenges, particularly like in the Lehigh Valley, again, there was a, a state house seat where uh, it was supposed to be a Latino opportunity district, but because of one person kind of got drawn into a different district from where she would have been best suited to run, she was probably the most promising candidate. Another person 
didn't get enough signatures to qualify for the ballot and you know was, was not able to be on the ballot and so they ended up with no Latino candidate on the ballot in this Latino opportunity district so I think that's the one where and, and I'm not gonna say candidate quality but you know just people not having the resources and enough advance notice and so forth to run for the district and, and get what they needed and there may also I'll mention may have been some issues uh, particularly with with just you know, because we had undercounts in the census, we had other issues like that. You know, there also may be in drawing Latino opportunity districts, you may have to think about there being a lot of immigrant or, or non-voting communities that, you know, maybe is not something we've really addressed in Pennsylvania before because we haven't really tried to do this before. And I think it would be good to do a more detailed VRA analysis on a lot of those districts. Um, so, you know, to, to actually make sure that not only do you have a, a, you know, majority Latino population or a large Latino population, you've actually got a large group of people who can and will be able to get out to the polls. So. I'll put in a plug too for Dave's redistricting. In a couple weeks, months, whenever, they will have the 2022 election results, which you can then put back to old maps and then see, be able to see that uh, right on. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the district number off the top of my head, but the uh, the representative I think is uh, Col Culver Schlegel, um, who is, she's a Republican, and uh, the Senate seat I believe she's considering running for is uh, Senator Gordner is apparently retiring in the middle of his term. So yeah, exactly, Republican to Republican basically. Yes. <laughs> You're like, what are they doing in Pennsylvania? Oh my God. <laughs> you want to take that one? <laughs> so the question is, is when only half the um, chamber is up for election, how does redistricting factor that in? Yeah, the, the entire map does get redrawn. So all 50 districts are in scope for redistricting, but only 25 of them are up for election on the first cycle after redistricting. There is a, a really diligent effort made not to change district numbers and especially not to change district numbers from odd to even because the evens are up in one cycle, the odds are up in another cycle. I don't think there were any exceptions this time around where they actually switched an odd to even or vice versa. So it turned out not to be a huge problem. The next, but it does mean that for two years, people are gonna be represented by representatives whom they elected based on an old map. And so as a result, some of the districts may overlap a little bit and you may have a representative, a senator who represents two, two overlapping sets of people. Uh, you, you may have people who don't actually have a senator in the Senate um, representing the district that they've now been drawn into. Very small boundary condition though, doesn't really happen very much on this map. Um, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. The question was, uh, since it was a buddy mander, does the Senate map reflect any significant change from the 2011-2012 map? And if it doesn't, what can we do about it? And do you want to take a crack at that? It's kind of a philosophical question. So I think two things. One thing is there were some changes, you know, particularly in the, uh, I, I know, you know, more about the changes in, in the Lehigh Valley area. They kind of changed, uh, I think, Wilkes-Barre a bit. Um, you know, there were some changes that, that are not insignificant and it may be that those changes will, will lead to some uh, changes in the 2024 uh, election cycle. So that's thing one, you know, get out to vote, do your work in 2024. Thing two is I think, you know, probably the most plausible thing given people's appetite for taking another crack at this is going to be work very hard to make sure that we have an independent commission in place for 2030 which is, is, you know, of course, our central mission here. So, I mean, you could try suing, I just don't know how, how, how if you'll get enough people taking you up is the question. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, okay, so the question is, why did the court draw the congressional map rather than the LRC? So, Pennsylvania's uh, map drawing process is sort of, has two, two halves to it. One is our constitution specifies a legislative reapportionment commission, which is, Four politicians plus a person they pick as their tiebreaker, whom they never actually pick, so the Pennsylvania Supreme Court picks them. And that person, th that commission is, is tasked by the Constitution with drawing the state legislative maps. But then, 
but then, yeah, state, state legislative being state house and state senate. And then the uh, congressional map, there's no process specified in our constitution for that at all. So they just pass it as an ordinary law, which means the state house, the state senate vote on it by simple majority, and then the governor signs it or doesn't. And if anything breaks down in there, which in this case the governor refused to sign it because it was a Republican gerrymander by the two Republican dominated uh, chambers of the legislature, then the Pennsylvania Supreme Court steps in. And there was actually impasse litigation uh, that, was, that was instigated long before the impasse actually occurred in order to make sure that it would be ready to go when the impasse inevitably did occur. And so that litigation took over at that point and became, became relevant and the map came out of that litigation. From, it was in fact the map proposed by the main named plaintiffs, the Carter plaintiffs. Thanks everybody, that was fun.